people think that goes away in April with the heat. Hello, welcome to Planet America. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chad the Chidello. One week to go. We're into the final frenetic stretch. Biden is still leading, but is Trump mounting another comeback? We're going to tell you what to look out for on Election Day and talk to former presidential candidate and DNC chair Howard Dean. But first... In the last few days of the 2020 presidential race, we are seeing two very different campaigns and conflicting closing arguments. President Trump is barnstorming crucial swing states with three or four rallies a day. Yesterday, it was Pennsylvania. Today, it was out west to Arizona and Nevada. And at the 11th hour, President Trump seems to have settled on a line of attack handed to him in last week's final debate. Would you close down the oil industry? I would transition from the oil industry, yes. Oh, I would transition. Thank it you. is a big statement That's a because big statement. I would stop. Why would you do that? Because the oil industry pollutes significantly. Oh. President Trump seized on that comment. Joe Biden admitted that he wants to abolish the oil industry. That wasn't too good. Right after the debate, Biden tried to walk it back a little. We get rid of the subsidies for fossil fuels, but we're not going to get rid of fossil fuels for a long time. It will not be gone for you know, probably 2050. President Trump, meanwhile, kept hammering and exaggerating the point on Twitter. Joe Biden confirmed his plan to abolish the entire U.S. oil industry. That means no fracking, no jobs, and no energy for Pennsylvania families. No energy? And the Trump campaign is already running this ad in Pennsylvania. Joe Biden's elected hill and fracking. No new fracking. That would be the end of my job and thousands of others. As well as being a political battleground, Pennsylvania has the largest known coal seam gas field in America and the industry employs over 30,000 people. But to be clear, Biden's energy plan does not ban all fracking. It bans new fracking on federal public lands, not existing fracking. No president can ban all fracking. His policy on new oil drilling permits is pretty much the same, Chaz. Yeah, I guess I was a bit surprised how this took off. I mean, Biden was careful to emphasise he was talking about a transition from oil that would end in 30 years' time. It's not exactly a super ambitious target. Yet, even after he repeated that, after the debate, the next question he got from the journos was, you're saying basically millions of people in those industries are going to lose their jobs? Yeah, after most of them have retired. <laughs> and while you could point to Pew polling finding just this month that 68% of voters say climate change is very or somewhat important to their vote, this is clearly a live enough issue to at least scare some energy state Democrats off. Kendra Horn, a Democrat representative in Oklahoma, tweeted, We must stand up for our oil and gas industry. We need an all-of-the-above energy approach. And Social Torres Small, a Democrat rep in New Mexico, tweeted, I disagree with Biden's statements tonight. Energy is the backbone of New Mexico's economy. Which, election aside, is a bit of a worry if you want to see climate action from a potential Democratic administration. Even if they do get rid of the filibuster, they still have two New Mexico senators and one Pennsylvania senator who might not be so keen on any fossil fuel reductions. In the meantime, we should say that Biden has, at least for now, put to bed the court packing issue with a classic politician's move. So I'll put together a national commission of bipartisan commission of scholars, constitutional scholars, Democrats, Republicans, liberal, conservative, and I will uh, ask them to, over uh, 180 days, come back to me with recommendations as to how to uh, reform the court system because it's getting out of whack. Ah, a bipartisan commission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Although at least the Biden is senile attack seems to be doing another round after this vintage Bidenism. And the character of the country, in my view, is literally on the ballot. What kind of country we're going to be? Mm -hmm. Four more years of George, uh, George, uh, he uh, is going to find ourselves in a position where. If uh, Trump gets elected, uh, we're going to be uh, we're going to be in a different world. Look, it's not a big deal, but whether he was referring to George W. Bush there or the interviewer whose name was George, either option wasn't the best. <laughs> Although, obviously, Biden was totally effective during last Friday's debate. Certainly more effective than this rather ironic billboard in Pennsylvania. Having said that, I will pay this ad from the Trump campaign. 
Here's how you can spot a zombie. Look for someone who has a corpse-like appearance, exhibits aggressive behavior, craves human flesh, and utters incoherent moans and groans. Uh, I don't know. With your help, we can prevent the zombie uprising. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. Joe Biden, meanwhile, spent a large part of the debate fending off Trump's attacks on his son Hunter's business interests in Ukraine. Trump brought a former business associate of Hunter Biden named Tony Bobulinski to the debate. Where have we seen that tactic before? Bobulinski claims the Bidens regularly discuss business with China. I've heard Joe Biden say that he's never discussed business with Hunter. That is false. I have first-hand knowledge about this because I directly dealt with the Biden family, including Joe Biden. And Bobulinski claims emails on a computer possibly belonging to Hunter Biden referring to, quote, the big guy getting a cut of Hunter's business deals was, in fact, Joe Biden. But so far there is still no evidence of Joe Biden doing anything unethical or illegal. And for now at least, Trump seems to have dropped the issue for lack of, well, anything. Meanwhile, the president's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, has been dropping other things. Giuliani appears to take off his microphone and then lays down on the bed and puts his hands in his pants for a few seconds. The whole thing recorded by what seemed to be hidden cameras. I have to say, Giuliani is Sasha Baron Cohen's zaniest character. Hardly believable. <laughs> <laughs> we should say, though, on that email you referred to about the big guy getting 10%, there was a question mark there that everyone seems to be ignoring. That 10% was a question, not a statement. And the reason that's important is because six days later, Hunter sent an email saying that my chairman, i.e. Joe Biden, gave an emphatic no, which doesn't prove anything, but it does seem to be worth noting. As is the fact that Hunter's other partner in that venture, James Gellier, said he was unaware of any involvement at any time of Joe Biden in their 2017 discussions. Also, that their activities never delivered revenue. Now, while it is true that Bobulinski has an email of Gellier's from the time saying, don't mention Joe being involved, the Bidens are paranoid, you don't have to take Gellier's word for it. The Wall Street Journal says the company's corporate records show no role for Joe Biden. And by the way, Biden has released decades of tax returns. If there's any money to be found, it's there. Whereas, by contrast, Trump has released no tax returns, yet we still know of him earning at least $200 million from foreign countries while he was president. So he might want to sit this one out. Yeah. Joe Biden's week, meanwhile, has been rather different to President Trump's, staying close to home for debate prep last week, relying on his old boss to stump for him in places like Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and Miami, Florida, where Obama held uh, one of these now familiar drive-in rallies. Now, listen, you, de you delivered twice for me, Florida, and now I'm asking you to deliver for Joe and, and deliver for Kamala. Meanwhile, Joe Biden did something rather unheard of in the final fortnight of a presidential campaign. He did nothing. On Sunday, Biden literally had no public event. Yesterday, he appeared in Pennsylvania, where he was born and where his campaign is headquartered. His focus remains firmly on the Trump administration's handling of the coronavirus pandemic, but he did field some questions as well about the state of the race, and he was sounding quite upbeat. With the grace of God and the goodwill of the neighbors, I'm going to win Pennsylvania. It's a matter of a great deal to me, personally as well as politically. I think we're going to win Michigan. I think we're going to win Wisconsin. I think we're going to win Minnesota. I think we have a fighting chance in Ohio. I think we have a fighting chance in North Carolina. We have a fighting chance in Georgia. A fighting chance in Iowa. One thing what they say, other thing is what they're doing, where they're spending their time. Biden has got stops planned this week in Iowa and Wisconsin. In Georgia today, we've got Florida in the next few days as well. James. Interestingly, though, on the air, Biden is going for a kind of broad, patriotic, feel-good messaging you'd normally associate with an incumbent seeking re-election. There is so much we can do if we choose to take on problems and not each other and choose a president who brings out our best. Joe Biden doesn't need everyone in this country to always agree. Just to agree, we all love this country and go from there. I'm Joe Biden and I approve this message. 
beautiful. <laughs> Easy to be cynical, but that's got the tone of a kind of Ken Burns Civil War documentary voiceover. Very reassuring stuff. Well, President Trump has been complaining about the amount of time the media is spending talking about the pandemic. That's all I hear. Turn on television. Right? COVID, 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 COVID. A plane goes down. 500 people dead. They don't talk about it. COVID, COVID, COVID. COVID. By the way, on November 4th, you won't hear about it anymore. <sighs> OK, quick fact check on that. There have only been two plane crashes in history that have killed 500 more people. One was in Japan in 1985. The other at Tenerife Airport involving two planes in 1977. So I guess that's why we're not talking about it. It is some time ago. The deadliest crash this year was a Ukrainian airliner mistakenly shot down by Iran back in January. 167 people died in that incident and it was widely reported at that time. Time. Mm. The Trump administration, meanwhile, was dealing with a gaffe this week. Chief of Staff Mark Meadows tried to cover up news that White House staff, including some of Vice President Mike Pence's top aides, had contracted coronavirus. Meadows defended Pence's decision to keep on campaigning rather than isolating himself, and then he said this. We're not going to control the pandemic. We are going to control the fact that we get uh, vaccines, therapeutics, and other mitigation Why aren't we going to get control of the because, pandemic? But because it is a contagious virus, just like the flu. Yep. Those words had barely left Mark Meadows' mouth before a Biden attack ad was on the air. We're not going to control the pandemic. It is a contagious virus, just like the flu. Yep. And Biden accused Trump of pursuing a policy of herd immunity at the cost of potentially millions of lives, he said. Yeah, millions of lives, probably a bit of a stretch. But this third wave of COVID is getting more serious. Last week, America set a new record of 81,000 cases in a day. And those daily case numbers still seem to be rising. It would particularly be an issue for the president that this wave seemed to be centred on swing states like Wisconsin. Over 5,000 new cases today alone. Now, Trump doesn't seem to have a huge amount of time for this kind of chatter, tweeting that the fake news is talking about cases, 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 but the cases are up because the testing is up. Look, we've done this before. More tests would lead to more cases being officially counted, yes. But this month, testing has only risen by 13%, whereas cases are up 51%. And by the way, percentage of tests that are positive has gone up from 4 to 6%. So no, this is not a statistical trick. There's just more COVID. In fact, more than 170 counties across 36 states are now considered COVID hotspots. And importantly, hospitalizations have increased in 38 states over the past week. That's got nothing to do with testing. More people are just getting sick. Most worryingly, there are now shortages in 29 of the 40 basic critical drugs used for COVID patients. So this wave is getting worse. Thankfully though, the daily deaths still have not taken off. 800 a day, that's not magnificent, but it's so much fewer than there were during the first wave. So that is good news. What I wouldn't say, though, is this. Even without the vaccines, we're rounding the turn. It's going to be over. In fact, Dr Fauci says the direct opposite, that even after there's a vaccine, it won't be case closed. He says there'll need to be public health measures for months and months, at least until the end of 2021, possibly into 2022. So Trump would not be enjoying that. He also wouldn't be enjoying that yesterday was the one-year anniversary of this Joe Biden tweet that got sent again all over Twitter. We are not prepared for a pandemic, Biden said a year ago. Trump has rolled back progress Obama and I made to strengthen global health security. We need leadership that mobilizes the world to stop outbreaks before they reach our shores. Biden really doesn't mention that tweet enough. Yeah, I'm not even sure he wrote the thing, but who knows? <laughs> Meanwhile, President Trump joined the ranks of early in-person voters this week, casting his ballot in his adopted home state of Florida. And he again took the opportunity to take a swipe at the integrity of mail-in voting. It was a very secure vote, much more secure than when you send in a ballot, I can tell you that. Everything was perfect, very strict. Right by the rules, when you send in your ballot, could never be like that. Could never be secure like that. And for reasons that nobody's been able to explain, Trump was in that voting booth for 16 minutes.
The early voting numbers, though, are off the charts. According to the US Elections Project, more than 69 million votes have already been cast. More than two-thirds of those are male and one-third in person. More than half of the total votes cast in 2016 have already been cast this year and there are over 40 million requested mail-in ballots that have still yet to be returned. Yeah, and there's a big advantage to Democrats there so far, John. In Florida, the Dems have a 460,000 vote lead already, or 10 percentage points. In Arizona, it's 16 percentage points. In Michigan, it's 24 percentage points. In North Carolina, it's 14 percent. Pennsylvania, the Dems have a 46 percent lead in early voting. And in Wisconsin, they have a 22 percent lead. Now, that's according to Bloomberg's outfit, Hawkfish. But importantly, that's all what we expected to happen. Democrats preferred to vote by mail this year. So it's hard to know if those numbers actually represent any actual extra voters for Democrats as yet. Yeah, we'll just have to wait and see on that rather than reading the tea leaves too early. Now to our special guest, Howard Dean. You remember him? Ah! <laughs> he was kind of the Bernie Sanders of 2004, a Democratic presidential candidate beloved by progressives, feared by the establishment and ultimately beaten by the boring moderate old white guy. Four years later, though, as chairman of the Democratic Party, Howard Dean helped to steward Barack Obama into the White House with a strong enough congressional majority to pass historic legislation, including the Affordable Care Act. Governor Dean, welcome back to Planet America. Thank you for having me. It's always great. A week to go from Election Day. How certain is the result to your mind? Well, there's a lot of uncertainty for two reasons. First of all, we all remember 2016 when we expected Hillary Clinton to win and Trump won. And second of all, because Trump cheats. And there's a number of states where you have to watch out for the voter suppression. Texas is one, Wisconsin is another, North Carolina is a third, and Georgia, which is the king of voter, uh, uh, you know, problems. So I'd say the election is not going to be known until well into Tuesday morning at the earliest. And how, Dean, what will you be looking for on election night itself to indicate how this is playing out? Well, one of them, of course, is always exit polls, uh, that, that they're pretty reliable and they're going to be very helpful in, in the swing states, such as Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Texas even. Georgia will be very important. Wisconsin... Uh, these are these are going to be critical indicators of how we do. Secondly, uh, turnout is going to be enormous. The turnout has already been enormous, probably favoring us, although the later turnout will probably be Republican. So I'm, I, I remain optimistic, but, you know, this is not going to be settled until uh, at least uh, eight days from now. What could those next eight days look like, do you think, given that President Trump has already said only the votes that are counted on election day should count? Well, that's just silly. But, you know, the president says a lot of silly things. Um, of course we should. We often don't know what the results are uh, that night, and we certainly didn't know them in 2000 when Bush v. Gore came down. So the president can talk with it however he wants. Most people think the Supreme Court is the final arbitrator. That is not true. The United States Constitution says that the Congress is the final arbitrator of who gets to be president. So uh, I don't expect it to stop at the Supreme Court, despite the fact that Trump just rammed justice on there as fast as possible. And, Governor, how confident are you that Democrats are on track to take a Senate majority next week as well? I think if Biden wins, we'll definitely take a majority in the Senate. But if Trump wins, I don't believe we will. So, you know, I mean, the, the Trump voters are the voters for the people who are running in the Senate. There's not going to be a lot of difference. Um, and uh, Susan Collins, I expect her to lose her seat in Maine, and I think that's because Trump is much less popular in Maine than he was four years ago. Uh, but, you know, again, we have a long way to go. A eight days doesn't sound like a long way to go, but unfortunately it is in our system. Former Vice President Biden is campaigning in Georgia today. He's in Arizona as well this week. Two red states uh, that he thinks he's got a chance in. But is he in danger of repeating Hillary Clinton's mistake of 2016 and losing sight of those crucial Rust Belt states that Democrats have to win? Well, unlike Hillary, he has spent a lot of time in the Rust Belt. He's been to Wisconsin. He's been to Michigan. Um, and, and he spent a tremendous amount of time in Pennsylvania. So I think those are optimistic signs. I don't think he's he's going to take any state for granted that's very close. And assuming Joe Biden is declared the winner in the next week or two, what is the period between then and the inauguration on the 20th of January next year look like? Because there are some nightmare scenarios being talked about. Well, I think it'll be a nightmare scenario. You know, Trump, I think, is psychiatrically disabled and his, his, his illness demands that he be in in, have as much attention as he possibly can. So I expect all kinds of nonsense, all kinds of outrageous pronouncements, accusations. Last year, he claimed citizens from Massachusetts were going across the border into New Hampshire and, and, 
And that's where the only reason he didn't win New Hampshire. So you'll get a lot of that sort of thing. Um, I do expect it to, be, it, it to be chaos right up until noon of January 20th. And, and are there particular things that you're expecting? Lots of pardons? Or I expect that. I expect him to pardon his family and probably himself, uh, if, if that's legal. And I think it probably is, although that will be a court test as well. Um, the court is in terrible shape. Uh, most of the 73% of people under 35 in this country don't believe that the court is a uh, is inclined to follow the law. They believe the court is inclined to follow politics. So they, we're going to have to do some major surgery on the Supreme Court and the whole court system. It's, it's really become just a political um, corrupt uh, organization, partly because so much money goes into recruiting these right-wingers, which the court is in the Supreme Court is now populated by. So this it was going to be, you know, America is going to be in some, um, some, uh, controversy for quite some time, uh, particularly um, uh, if Trump wins, but it will also be if Biden wins. Governor Howard Dean, thanks for being with us on Planet America. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, John, only seven days to go. It is time to get into the nitty gritty to the world. Big, beautiful world. Okay, we've got two more shows before Election Day, so we're going to be talking about this stuff a heap more. But I just want to give you a basic checklist for what to look out for on Wednesday afternoon. So let's start with the presidential election. These are the battleground states from the most Biden-friendly states through to the most Trump-friendly states, according to 538. In 2016, the Democrats took those two states and Trump took the rest. And these are the states that, according to 538, they're projecting that Biden has an 86% chance or greater of winning. So you'd need a poll error of over five and a half points for Trump to win any of these states. Now, that is possible, although the poll error was only that large in one state, Wisconsin, in 2016. So if Biden wins, just these battleground states, we're talking about flipping these three yellow states, that's it, then he is president. But for reasons I'll explain on Friday, none of these three key states are likely to be called on Wednesday unless it's a smashing. However, these three states are all likely to be called on Wednesday. And if Biden wins any of these three, then he can afford to lose one of these states and he'll be pretty much home. The same applies to all these states here, except for Iowa, which is so small, it doesn't really count for anything, but these states are all more likely to go to Republicans. So basically on Wednesday, just focus on these three states. If Biden wins one of them, then this is gonna be over fast. But if Trump wins all three of these states, then we could be waiting for those three yellow states. It could take days, maybe even weeks, and it's going to be a slugfest. Now, of course, no president can get anything done without the Senate, so we should look at that as well. The battleground states there are all currently held by Republicans, except for Michigan and Alabama. And the Senate is currently 47 Democrats, 53 Republicans, where the President's party holds the Senate if it's 50-50. Now, I would keep one eye on Michigan because the Republican there, John James, he's capable of an upset against the Democrats' invisible man, Gary Peters. But let's assume that the Democrats do keep Michigan. I mean, there is an 80% chance of that, according to 538. Let's also assume they lose Alabama, which they're currently struggling in. That would then leave the Democrats with 46 seats. They're extremely likely to win Colorado and Arizona, so that would put them then at 48 seats. Now, on Wednesday, Maine is likely to be an early call. That's Susan Collins' seat. If the Democrats beat her, that would take them to 49. But if Susan Collins wins, then the Republicans are very likely to hold the Senate. So that's the first state to look out for. The next one to look out for is North Carolina. That should also be an early call. That's where the Democrat, Cal Cunningham, was doing very well until he got involved in a super lame sexting scandal. Historically sexy. But he's still amazingly ahead in the polls. And if he wins that seat and the Democrats win Maine, 
that would get the Democrats to 50 seats and they would win the Senate if Biden wins. But if either of those seats don't come off, then they're going to need one more prospect and that could be Iowa, which is extremely 50-50 at the moment. Republican Joni Ernst got into huge trouble recently when she tried to fudge the break-even price of soybeans. I might have missed it, I don't think you answered my question. What's the break-even price for soybeans in Iowa? You grew up on a farm, you should know this. Uh, I think you had asked about corn, and I, it depends I, on... I asked her corn. It depends on what the field. inputs are, but probably about 550. Well, you're a couple of dollars off, I think, here, because it's uh, 10.05, so well, we'll move on to something else. Then. Oh, they play for keeps in Iowa. Doesn't she look happy? But basically, these three are the states to watch on Wednesday for the Senate. These final states here will only be in play if Democrats have a great night. So these are the states that will determine who wins the Senate. Democrats need two of those three states. And really, they want all three if they want a Biden presidency to do anything. Because Joe Manchin will be one of those Democrats and he is damn near a Republican. So here is your checklist for Wednesday. Biden wants to win any one of these three states for the presidency. Whereas Trump needs to win all three to stay in the contest. And the Democrats need to win two of the re these three states to win the Senate, whereas the Republicans will be feeling pretty good if they can win two of them. The stage is set. Big, beautiful world. So, after all of these days, months and years, here we are, finally one week out from the election, and it's a day which at different times neither candidate looked like reaching. September last year, President Trump was on his way to being impeached. Breaking news overnight, President Trump personally ordered the suspension of hundreds of millions of dollars in military aid to Ukraine just days before he encouraged their president to investigate his political rival, Joe Biden. And in February this year, Joe Biden looked like he was down for the count. And the one-time frontrunner, Fallen. Former Vice President Joe Biden coming in a distant fifth, speaking to supporters from South Carolina. It ain't over, man. We're just getting started. Turns out he was right. And less than seven days out from the election, Biden is the favourite to be elected 46th President of the United States. They do say a week is a long time in politics, but after a two-year campaign, how much really changes in the final days? Well, in 2016, the answer was... Quite a lot. Federal investigators have obtained a warrant to look deeper into a laptop. That laptop belonging to Anthony Weiner, the estranged husband of Clinton's top aide, Huma Abedin. And while there was nothing to incriminate Hillary Clinton, the damage was done. According to 538's polling guru Nate Silver, the announcement the FBI had reopened their email investigation was probably enough to cost Clinton the presidency, swinging Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin to Trump, and potentially costing Clinton, Florida, North Carolina and Arizona as well. In 2012, Republican Mitt Romney had high hopes of making Barack Obama a one-term president a week before polling day, and Romney was still just in front in the average of national polls, where he'd been for most of October. Then Hurricane Sandy hit, and Obama rose to the moment while Romney looked a little irrelevant. The storm has put Romney in something of a bind, while the president can go back and lead relief efforts. This is something that uh, is heartbreaking for the entire nation. There's not much for Romney to do beyond encouraging supporters to pitch in. Still, the Romney campaign went into Election Day thinking they had enough support to win, but Obama's campaign delivered where and when it mattered for an almost four-point win. A week before the 2008 election, it was pretty clear Barack Obama was going to win, but six weeks earlier, it had been a different story. In mid-September, Republican John McCain was two points ahead of Obama nationally. But then... There's the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, the sale of Merrill Lynch to Bank of America, and word of trouble with the world's largest insurance company, American International Group. The stock market suffered one of its worst days in years. Within a week, the rolls and the polls were reversed. Obama was two points ahead and never looked back. 2020 has been a very different race. Joe Biden has led all the way in the average of national polls. The closest Trump got was back in late January when he was still four points behind. A week out from the election, it is almost double that. 538's poll averages are even more bullish on Biden, putting his lead at over nine points. 
In that time, of course, a pandemic has hit the economy, has been shut down and unemployment has surged. Unlike Obama in 2008 and 12, President Trump has not been seen by most voters to have risen to the challenge and led in a crisis. It's going away now. It'll go away. Like things go away. Absolutely. Right now, it's hard to see what could change what seems to be a fundamental dynamic of this election. Quite simply, more voters want Trump replaced than returned. But yes, Chaz, a lot can happen in a week. Well, Rasmussen disagree with you. Mm. A few days ago, they said the president's approval was at 52%, which would easily win him re-election. The only problem is every other pollster in the Real Clear Politics average had Trump's approval at least eight points lower than his disapproval. In fact, according to Real Clear Politics, Trump's average approval rating has never been above 47.4%. And guess what day in 2020 that occurred? Mm, don't know. April Fool's Day! <laughs> yes, really. But whatever the state of the election, I think we know people are going to turn out. Gallup also asked people whether the outcome of the election mattered to them more than in previous years. 77% of people said yes. That is the most amount of caring about an election result since they started asking people in 1996. So they'll be showing up all right. Yesterday, 48-year-old Judge Amy Coney Barrett became President Trump's third nominee to be confirmed to the United States Supreme Court, following a narrow 52-48 vote, which went along party lines except the defection of Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine. Democrats maintained the nomination was being inappropriately rushed through before the election and was inconsistent with the Republicans' own refusal to confirm a Liberal justice in an election year back in 2016. Within two hours of the Senate vote, Judge Barrett was sworn in at the White House with another controversial conservative nominee of your Clarence Thomas chosen to preside. I, Amy Coney Barrett, do solemnly swear. Can't help think that was a little bit of a troll as well, getting old Clarence out there. Senate Republicans couldn't conceal their delight either. A giddy Judiciary Committee Chair Lindsey Graham hopped straight onto Fox News. A lot of threats going on about <laughs> packing the court and ending the Ooh. legislative filibuster Ooh. and uh, amnesty Ooh. and a lot of power grabs. Um, not easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the internet's melting down. I mean, there is an absolute desire to take me out. Woo-hoo! <laughs> like an owl there, Lindsay. And the internet was melting down with this snarky tweet from the Republican Judiciary Committee's account. Amy Coney Barrett confirmed, happy birthday, Hillary Clinton. And yes, Hillary Clinton turned 73 yesterday. If she had won the 2016 election, there would likely be a 5-4 liberal majority on America's highest court today. Instead, it is a 6-3 conservative court, putting women's reproductive rights, affordable health care and voting rights in doubt, but also giving Democrats a powerful motivating force to vote and retake the White House and the Senate this year. Hi. Have you been experiencing strange feelings as if everything has happened before? 33,000 emails that have been deleted. All of the emails, the emails, the horrible emails. If the answer is yes, you may be experiencing a debilitating condition called deja vu. Typical politician, all talk, no action, just right. a typical politician. It's all talk, no action with these politicians. It's a dangerous illness that can cause symptoms such as stress. Lock her up is right. Lock up the Bidens. <sighs> Helplessness. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton with a fiery exchange over Russian interference in the U.S. election. The top target of Russian election interference in the 2020 election appears to be Joe Biden. <sighs> and potentially severe mental trauma. And I'm afraid the election's going to be rigged, I have to be honest. The only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. <sighs> But this is all completely normal. I mean, the circumstances are absolutely batshit, but your reactions are normal, to a point. Clinton is leading Donald Trump nationally by nine points. Joe Biden leading President Trump nationally by nine points. <sighs> I don't even know what's real. Is this real? Are you real? Am I real? Is this campaign ever gonna end? Why does nothing ever end? If this sounds like you, then call the number on your screen now. I'm not a doctor. I just desperately need someone to talk to. Deja vu. It's French for we're f***ed. Deja vu. It's French for we're f***ed.
That is all for Planet America. Don't Woo! miss next week's live two-hour super-sized election night spectacular. Woo! We have some great guests for you. We'll be on the news channel from 9 Eastern time and the regular time on ABC TV right after Reputation Rehab. And we'll be back this Friday for a fireside chat and we're going to be answering your questions about this election. Woo! What do you want to know? Ask us on Twitter with the hashtag Planet America or on our Facebook page where you can also find a brand new pet podcast right now. You can find it there. Good night.